this year and, and in subsequent years, about 70% of the times predictions are way off with the notoriously unreliable preseason forecast. You have to rely on accurate in-season management information and, and act on that information in order to tailor your harvest rates. There's lots of things that happen out in the ocean that we can't always measure on a day-to-day. -day. It's very expensive to be out in the ocean trying to track salmon. What we can do though, and what we do as far as threats, is monitor those fish as they return. So while we can't change it, we can at least monitor and understand uh, what's happening as the climate change. Managing it with uncertainty, I think uh, a good example is last year. Fraser Sockeye, we had a forecast of about 10 million fish that were going to return to the Fraser River system. Well, what did happen is that we had a record return. We had uh, 30 million plus fish return. Did we anticipate that? No. Um, our science forecast had a large range around that, but even that uh, large return was on the upper end of that, uh, of that forecast. So what, did we, what, what do we do is don't just rely on a forecast. You have in-season tools that go out and collect information. So it's been adaptive uh, to changing circumstances. It's simple data like how many salmon have returned, how many do we catch, how many juveniles are released. What changes are happening within those salmon ecosystem, both marine, freshwater, and terrestrial? And how do we influence, as humans, how do we influence all of that? So there's a number of simple research that needs to be done and real-time data collection that really needs to happen to get any long-term gain. Earlier on in the season, identify run size. We're able to more fairly allocate how much of each species will be caught by each catching method. So as we're gathering more information as the fish is still at sea, that will allow us to better, better control and allocate pieces by catch method or, or area. I think we're making good progress. I think um, we've clearly identified uh, the conservation units. We've clearly identified habitat indicators of what we would like to see within the habitat. We've made uh, good progress in a num number of areas within BC of implementing the policy, but it, I would say um, it's not going as fast as some would like to see it implemented, and for others it's probably going too fast. Well, first I'll mention some of the things that have happened. They have done some excellent background science work defining these conservation units, setting up what habitat monitoring looks like. So they've done some of the good background work. The challenge is applying it. Many of us are frustrated that the implementation has been quite slow on many aspects of the policy. So there are lots of statements in there. It was written in 2005 and it says things like, within two years we will do this and we will do that. And you know, that, was, that, was, that time has kind of come and gone now. We know what habitat characteristics we need to monitor. It's not a large list, but with these salmon spread out in such a vast area, it's a large task to figure out who is going to monitor these habitat indicators. To kick it into a higher gear, uh, the main issue there is the amount of funding that's available to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, to actually make it happen. We see leadership from industry, we see leadership from government, now it's a matter of really coming together and taking this to the final step. Uh, applying the Wild Town Policy directly to address the threats we can, uh, reform the practices that need to be reformed. If we do this, we're going to have salmon around for a long time and we're going to have the most productive and resilient fisheries possible. By defining conservation uh, and what that means, it's allowed some industry leaders to get out ahead and say, what can we do to solve this problem where we can? And so in the fishing industry, there's some people now working to develop more selective fishing practices, improving monitoring within their fisheries so that we can have an understanding of where the impact is, and working with diverse stakeholders to develop recovery plans for some of these conservation units at risk. Ultimately, it's going to come down, I think, largely to these industry leaders uh, leading the way, uh, us supporting them, and then the federal government f following along essentially and, and hopefully facilitating some of this, but where necessary also taking leadership to really help these leaders in the fishing industry by addressing some of the other threats to salmon so that the federal government's doing its part to conserve the habitat, deal with some of the other threats that's putting some of these uh, industries at risk. It's also important that we recognize it's not just the companies that are already there or the fisheries that are already there, it's the fisheries that are moving to, to get to a better place and we need to support those fisheries. They're the ones that are enacting change right now and they're making a conscious decision to get to a better place, to create a more sustainable uh, offering.